is a biological clock, and we said it's basically associated with parts of the brain that um, are associated with your light receptors in some way. So and I think it was insects, it was close to the optic chiasma. In mammals and birds, we think it has to do with the pineal gland to some extent, and in mammals, it's the lower part of the hypothalamus, which is close to the optic chiasma, stuff like that. Um, and so we're going to continue on talking about biological clocks. Again, just to make sure we're on the same page, circadian rhythm is your 24-hour rhythm. Um, your biological clock is the, is the timing of physiological changes that take place over your whole lifetime, right? So not just a day over your lifetime. All right, so to function as a good biological clock, you do need an internal mechanism that has a 24-hour rhythm. So you need a circadian rhythm. They are connected to one another. And then your circadian rhythm needs to be able to reset by environmental cues. And if you remember from last time, I said that uh, uh, temperature is a terrible cue, that we're mostly going to focus on light, which is basically our topic right now anyway. So that's really the environmental cue that it's talking about. So for example, today, this morning, it's chilly. And then I think tomorrow it's 90 degrees, right? Um, and then 90 degrees, and then we might have a hurricane later this week. I don't know if y'all are paying attention to that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Wish I had a video of that. What now? <laughs> yeah, that's why. Uh, to be fair, that's why my mom wasn't texting me. She knows I watch the little like 10 minutes of news every morning. So I, I knew that there was a shooter before they. But I also knew it wasn't anywhere close. Like we should text my sister. I'm like. What? Was it, I knew it was in Kentucky, but I thought it was Eastern Kentucky. And I'm like, why is she upset? Maybe it was Paducah, but no, it wasn't Paducah. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of confusion in my mind this morning. Anywho, uh, but what we do have going on uh, is we have shortening days leading up to our equinox, which will be very close to when we have our exam, actually. All right, uh, it has to be able to run in the absence of environmental cues. And I, I touched on this a little bit at the beginning the introduction of this is this if you take an animal and you put it in darkness it still keeps a innate approximately 24-hour rhythm it still keeps a circadian rhythm it does get out of sync slowly with the outer external environment um, if it doesn't have cues to help keep it on track which means that they're reset <coughs> regularly uh, by the dawn and dusk basically and it has to be able to run at all temperatures so you can't be slow sometimes and fast sometimes it needs to be the same, regardless of whether you're an ectotherm or endotherm. And so keeping that in mind, we're gonna talk about two basic models of biological clocks. Um, the first model is the simplest, and it's called the Bunning model. Get it all up there, there we go. Um, and then I just drew it, drew it as a circle here. Uh, you can add some writing to this circle, because <laughs> it's not very creative, right? It's not very good visual. Uh, but basically what it is, it's going to begin with the onset of light. So if you put dawn right here, and it's going to go to the onset of dawn the next day. right? So there's a point on this circle where light starts, and that is the entire cycle. That's all it is. So it's one day, one single oscillation per day. And it doesn't take into account seasonal changes in day length, because every day is 24 hours. In other words, it's not keeping up with how much light you have versus how much dark you have. It's just the 24-hour cycle. It also doesn't care whether you're active during the light or during the dark. It just starts at light and then comes back 24 hours later when light starts again. And so that's the simplest, and it's also pretty much just the definition of circadian rhythm. The weakness of this model is in that smaller bullet, and that is it doesn't really account for seasonal changes very well. <coughs> All that's going to happen is your dawn's going to shift, right? And so if this is dawn in the winter, in the summer, what's happening now is dawn is shifting down this way, which is weird I'm saying my name a lot. That's okay. Um, but it's still just going to keep going around to dawn, right? That's all it's going to do. It's not really going to count for how much light and dark. All right. So that leads us to the only other model we're going to talk about. We're starting out with a very simple model. Um, and that's the two oscillator model. And so an oscillation, go ahead and get that term because we'll talk about it when we do predator-prey stuff later this semester. But an oscillation means you make a circle. That's all an oscillation means. Um, it gets misinterpreted because if you take predator-prey relationships and you look at the model like we're going to, it makes a circle. 
Uh, but usually what they do is they uh, flatten that out and they make it look like a wave, right? So that you see the predator prey does this type of thing when you map them together. Uh, but in reality, the model doesn't do that. The model is actually a circle. And it talks about oscillations, all right? And so the two oscillator model, as the name suggests, we're going to have two circles. Uh, one circle is going to get your light period, so it's going to go from dawn to dusk. And the other gets your dark period, which is going to go from dusk to dawn, right? So you have your light and dark. And what that does is it allows us to account for changing amounts of light and dark. And so we could have this, which would represent what happens during what time of the year? Summer. Yep, summer, spring and summer. And this. Fall. Yeah, that's what we're, we're not there yet, right? We won't get there until after the equinox. Uh, but from the equinox to the spring solstice, that's what we look like. All right. So in other words, it's able to take into account seasonal changes in the light-dark light cycle, which makes it a little bit more useful in a lot of ways. Now, as you might guess, we looked at these two models just to kind of illustrate the importance of taking into account the amount of light that you have in your day. And there are lots of different models that we actually dove deeper into this topic, just not really my area. I think it's more Dr. Shaw's. He's a physiological guy. He does uh, hormones and stuff. Uh, related to hamsters, I believe. I don't know. Okay, which you might not know because mostly he teaches human A&P, right? <clears throat> okay, so why are we worried about these biological clocks? What's the adaptive value of them? Uh, one, I kind of touched on this a little bit last time because I feel like it's important to put them in the context, uh, but it helps you anticipate environmental cues so if you're a salamander, you need to be active at night. And so some of the environmental cues that you can anticipate is as the sun goes down, humidity is going to go up. It's going to have less light, which is going to less likely to dry you out, those types of things. And so it's not necessarily, this is suggesting, it's not necessarily sensing the increasing humidity, but rather it knows that decreasing light is going to lead to nighttime conditions, which are better for it to be active. That's what this is saying. Uh, if you're a bat, um, then as it starts to get dark, you anticipate that the things that you're going to eat are going to start to wake up and fly around. Right? So you're anticipating those types of things. Uh, so some of them are related to biotic rather than physical, and that's where I jumped ahead a little bit. The predators need to be active when their prey are active, and so it's not really at waking up because of their physical environment. So bats aren't active at night because it likes nighttime conditions better. They're active at night because that's when their prey are active and they become specially adapted to capture that type of prey, of course. All right, so they can anticipate environmental cues, which are different between the light cycle and the dark cycle, <clears throat> but some of them are taking advantage of these organisms that are reacting to the environmental cues to be active when their prey is active. <clears throat> All right, any questions about that? <clears throat> All righty. On the next slide, we get into these terms that I keep using, and y'all do seem to have a grasp of it, hopefully, but if you don't, this is the time to get it all cleared up. Um, and this is talking about the seasonal changes that take place in our uh, light-dark cycles. And it gives the four critical days that we have throughout the year. Uh, and so we are approaching the autumnal equinox, and so I always list that first since this class is in the fall. Uh, I have listed there September 22nd, but there is some fluctuations, so it could be just 21st, 22nd, 23rd, but it's usually around that time period. And on the autumnal equinox, equinox means equal, and so this is where you have equal amounts of light and darkness all over the entire planet. You're supposed to be able to balance a broom on its handle, and an egg supposed to be able to stand on its point, right, all those types of things. <clears throat> that leads us to the winter solstice, and in the winter solstice, that's when we have our longest night, our longest night. And so what I really need you to understand is what is happening to the day length between each one of these benchmarks. And so as we go from September to December, so from the autumnal equinox to the winter solstice, days are shortening. We have less light. I'm, I don't know why it takes so long to kick in, but like in the last week, I'm like, oh, you know, 7 o'clock, I'm sitting, sitting inside and it's dark, right? Whereas a month ago, I would still have been out in my hammock reading a magazine or something. 
You know what a magazine is? I'll explain. <laughs> and I don't know why I said that, because if I was reading a magazine, it would still be on my tablet. It wouldn't be like a real magazine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> then we go from the winter solstice to our vernal equinox. And this is, uh, well, before we do that, on the winter solstice, uh, what is happening to the day length at the equator? It doesn't happen on the equator. Okay. On the equator, you're 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark every day, all year. And it's kind of freaky for us. So like, uh, one of the times we went to Brazil, we went in, uh, we went in January one time and that didn't bother us so much. I guess it was when we went in August. I'm just trying to think when we went. So we went in August. And so here we were experiencing long days Right. Warm, long days in August. We went down to Brazil, and uh, it was a very busy day. We got up, um, we saw stuff, we went, uh, we went hiking into the rainforest, we camped, uh, we, were, we set up camp, we cooked, at this point it's dark, we cooked uh, chickens and rice, and we had dinner, and then somebody had brought some tequila, so we were passing that around with some orange crush, and then we were taking those... Uh, uh, Lifesavers, the uh, winter greens, if you bite those, they spark. Did y'all know that? So we were doing that since it was so dark in the rainforest, which is kind of cool. I didn't know they sparked. And so we did all of this, and we're like, oh, man, I'm so tired. I'm going to bed. So we got in our hammocks <laughs> in the rainforest, and uh, he's not here anymore. The fisheries biologist, Dr. Ray, was my partner on this trip. And he came by, and he goes, y'all do realize it's 8 o'clock, right? We're like, what? <laughs> we thought it was like midnight. And what was happening is, is that even though it felt like summer to us, and we were adapted to the long days of summer, uh, sun was rising at six and setting at six every day. And so we had started our, 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 uh, you know, campfire activities at six o'clock, <laughs> had fun for a couple hours, and we're ready for bed. So it's six hours. Doesn't matter what time of year. It's always six hours, or uh, always twelve hours light, twelve hours dark, not six hours. Six, six a.m., six p.m. All right, and what's happening at the uh, North Pole during the winter, what we, we would call the winter solstice, December 21st, 22nd? They're in complete darkness. Yes, they're in complete darkness. The sun doesn't rise on that day. However, when you, if you were at the South Pole, this would actually be your summer solstice. So it would be your longest day in which the sun doesn't set. Okay. It just kind of goes low and then comes back up. Okay. So we're, in other words, we're Northern Hemisphere biased, right? Northern Hemisphere's winter is Southern Hemisphere's summer. All right. Um, where were we? We're in the winter. Okay. This can also, in some people's minds, uh, be a little bit of a problem. It seemed like y'all were already kind of on board. But as you go from the winter solstice to the vernal equinox, which means January, February, March, our days are actually lengthening, right? So we're getting more light. This is our longest day, and then we're starting to have our longest night, and then our day length begins to, to increase again. Leading us to our spring equinox, which is in March. That's uh, 12 hours light, 12 hours dark all over the planet again. And then from March until June, our days will continue to lengthen until June we get our longest day. And then during the dog days of summer, again, July and August, which people think about having our long, long days of sunlight, like I just said, that's what we interpret. Our days are actually getting shorter during that time period. And so days are shortening, shortening, lengthening, lengthening. Okay, any questions about that? I don't know if this is a silly question, but so does that actually mean that like versus the northern hemisphere, the southern Mm -hmm. Yes, they're opposite of ours. Absolutely. I'm just now grasping this. That's fine. No problem. <laughs> uh, when I went to um, Botswana, which is in southern Africa, um, we went in November around around uh, Thanksgiving, like a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving, because that was spring. It was weird, <laughs> but that's what it was, and everything was leafy green, just like here, that first green of spring. That's what it was like all over in uh, Botswana in November. And then one time I went to um, Buenos Aires um, 
in Argentina, and it was uh, summer, I guess. No, that's the problem. It was we went um, New Year's. We flew on New Year's Eve and had New uh, New Year's Day in the airplane. And when we landed in Buenos Aires, it was summer, which we expected, but they had a cold front, and so we were like, "What? We didn't have the right clothes." <laughs> But they were supposed to be in summer while we were in winter. But yeah, Australia. So um, to give you another example, Australia goes through winter first. Um, and so that's their flu season while we're having our summertime. And so our flu vaccines are often based on the flu virus that was most prevalent in Australia during their winter as a prediction for our winter. Which is also why we miss sometimes, because Australia is pretty far from here at the end of the day. <clears throat> All right, anything else about that? Okay. The reason I spent some time and had us think about it, which sounds like a good, good idea that we did, is because it leads to this idea of critical day length. All right, and so if you need environmental cues to let you know it's time to start your breeding season or it's time to migrate or some of these things that you need to do in your annual cycle. Uh, choosing the equinox as your day to make that decision is a bad idea. Because right? the equinox itself is 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark. And so if you don't account for the lay days leading up to the equinox, then you're not going to know which one it is, basically. You're not going to know whether it's the spring or the fall. If you're just purely uh, making your decision based on the amount of light to darkness. And so when we talk about critical day length, and as you're looking at the definition here, it refers to the days leading up to the equinox and not necessarily the equinox itself. Okay? So in other words, it's a little misleading. It says critical day length, but it's actually the length of several days that you're averaging into going into the equinox, right? So a little misleading there. So I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, first example is with birds. And so they use the lengthening of the days leading up to the vernal equinox to signal their breeding season. And so the lengthening of the day will cause them to come into breeding physiology, which for the males means <clears throat> their testes will swell and begin to produce testosterone, which will lead to their aggressive behavior, which causes them to set up territories and do that type of thing. And for the females, that means their estrogen will increase and that they will become into reproductive status and start having eggs that are viable and things like that. Also means that if we take birds uh, that are fall birds and bring them into the lab and slowly lengthen the day length on them, we can, breed, we can bring them into uh, breeding physiology, which we have done um, as an experiment. So we can make them think that it's breeding season in December if we put them in lab conditions that are appropriate with the right day lengths. So they're very much tied to the day length. Okay, so birds breed in the spring, and so lengthening days leading up to the equinox is their critical day length. Uh, mammals are a little bit different. It's a little bit larger mammal bias too in this description. Uh, but in mammals, they use the shortening days leading up to the autumnal equinox to signal the onset of their breeding season. So think about deer, basically. Um, it's not uncommon for mammals to be pregnant during the winter time, and that way they're giving birth by spring uh, to take advantage of the resources and water available during the springtime. Okay, and so this one I've got a little bit more information for you. So what we're looking for for our critical uh, day length right now is, in other words, it's saying for white tailed deer, it's right now when the days are shortening. Uh, when the days are shortening, that means that you have longer dark periods, and during dark periods, mammals produce a hormone called melatonin. Uh, most people know melatonin nowadays because you can buy it over the counter as a sleep aid, and now we're getting concerned that people are doing that too much, so you hear a lot more about it in the news, so who knows what will happen as we go into the future. I don't know if any of y'all take advantage of it. I am apparently very sensitive to it. Um, I had a dog that had uh, Cushing's disorder, which is an adrenal disorder, and they put her on melatonin, and she was older, she was like 14, so she also had to take a pepsin, an acid reducer, 
And so I went, uh, I went, and I was out of Pepsid, and I'm like, well, I'll just, I'll just steal one of uh, one of Rosie's Pepsids, and I accidentally got her melatonin instead, and I was out. That was it for me for the rest of the day. So apparently, I'm sensitive to it. Uh, but this is something that you produce while you're sleeping, and so as the days lengthen, you're sleeping, or the darkness is extended, and you're producing more melatonin, which is going to trigger that physiological response in things like white-tailed deer. It's going to cause them to produce uh, more testosterone if you're the male deer. It causes the neck to thicken, all that kind of stuff. Puts you into reproductive status. Gets your eggs and sperm ready uh, for uh, your reproductive attempt. All right. Any questions about critical day length? And how it's not the equinox. It's the days leading up to the equinox. It's the actual signal. All right, for birds, you could also look at migration patterns. Most of the textbooks tend to focus on reproduction because that's pretty uniform across all the animals. Uh, but reproduction is not the only thing that's controlled by your biological clock. And so birds and some mammals, there are also mammals that migrate. Uh, this is also going to be controlled by the photo period. And so about midsummer, the birds that migrate will suddenly click off reproduction and they'll click on preparation for migration, which is another hormonal shift. So the reproductive hormones switch off, and then in particular, it's a hormone called cortis, cortis, uh, cortisterone in birds, it's called cortisol in mammals. It's a little different um, structure. That begins to be produced in their uh, body, which causes them to get restless and puts them in the mood to migrate, essentially. So it's a physiological that shifts, that takes place. And it's pretty crazy. We were uh, out monitoring nest boxes for prothonotary warblers one summer. And we got to the first part of July, maybe mid-July, and we were still having them starting nests and laying eggs. And then one day we started checking them and nothing would change. So there were like four eggs in the nest and it stayed four eggs in the nest. And they never came back. Like on, on the certain day length, or probably not that exact day, but within that range of day lengths, they just clicked off. Wherever they were in their reproductive cycle, it just clicked off and then they began preparing for migration. It was crazy. Not all birds will do that. And then we have some birds around here that stay year round, like Eastern bluebirds, they stay year round. They don't really migrate. Our population doesn't migrate anyway. And they'll continue to reproduce into September and October if the weather stays nice. So it, got, it just depends. All right. Uh, there are other patterns that we could talk about, uh, such as tidal lunar cycles are tied together. That's why I have the little slash in there because uh, the lunar cycle has a big impact on our tidal cycle. It is the pool. I finally got this figured out. I was listening to the star talk so I finally understood it. Let's see if I can make y'all understand it. <laughs> Some of you probably do. Uh, but as we rotate, the moon's up here and as we rotate around the moon, the moon's gravity pulls against the planet essentially. And so the bodies of water are particularly impacted like this and so as the ocean rotates away from the moon, the moon's gravity pulls against the ocean, and that's what causes our tides, essentially. Uh, now, the podcast I was listening to uh, was talking about how the moon is coming into sync where it's not going to move anymore. We'll be in a tide, uh, the, um, I had a word, something lock. Anybody, anybody like astrophysics? I like astrophysics. Anyway, they'll become locked where we're no longer rotating away from the moon, but the moon's moving with us, essentially. And at that point, we'd have no more tides which I think probably is what finally locked it into my brain a little bit. And so tidal lunar cycles are very much tied to each other. And you can see some of these rhythms um, on here. But if you think about crabs, like fiddler crabs and things like that, that are um, tied to the type of environment, um, this is going to be very important. If you take something like a fiddler crab into a lab and you give it a large cage, not the little play cage like you see in the pet stores, right? Um, they're going to move with the lunar cycles. Um, so they're going to follow those natural rhythms, um, natural 24-hour cycle rhythms associated with that. Okay, any questions about that? All right, so that was kind of our beginning of organismal slash physiological ecology. We did carbon, heat, a little bit of water, and uh, light. Those are the four big ones that we talked about. Uh, we're still going to be doing physiological ecology, but we're going to shift into niche theory a little bit. And as we're talking about factors that impact an organism's niche, 
we can look at that either at an organismal or a population level. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap into that as you talk about environmental factors. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to make sure we are clear on these two terms, that like we all got them coming out of freshman bio or general ecology, and that is interspecific interactions versus intraspecific interactions. And so interspecific means between different species. And we could talk about predator prey, you know, that type of stuff. We could talk about host parasite. There's a lot of things that we can discuss there. The key being that there are two different species are having some type of interaction. So uh, at the top, you've got a leopard and a lion. Most likely there's something dead nearby, right, that they're fighting over. Uh, over here, I don't know what's happening, but it's a crazy picture. There's a European starlings. They're obviously fighting over seeds, so it's probably, a, probably somebody's got a feeding station or something. Um, if you're on an interstate, <coughs> that means that you can go from one state to another. That's what an inter means, right, between different states. Um, we don't usually say intrastate. We just call them a highway. And so if you're on, like, Highway 22, that actually doesn't cross over into Kentucky. And if it does, it changes number because it's not, uh, because it is a Tennessee state highway. So it's an intrastate, okay? And so intraspecific means between members of the same species. And so we basically have the same type of interaction here between both of these. Um, probably related to a female nearby watching this interaction to see who's the strongest male. <laughs> right? So we'll talk about that more at some point. All right, any questions about those two terms? All right, to put us into perspective, I want to define habitat and talk about scale, and then we'll dive into niche biology. <clears throat> uh, habitat is the place where the organism lives. It's often described as the organism's address. And then niche, if you go with like your general ecology, freshman biology type stuff, um, niche is its job, right? So habitat's its address and niche is its job. Um, of course, that's a little bit basic. We're going to expand past that definition a little bit. But it describes where they can be found. It can also describe what type of habitat they're using to some extent. Like, where would you expect to find them? Just a general description of where they're located, essentially. That's the habitat. It can be at many different spatial scales. And so on this slide, we've got a very broad spatial scale. We've got a red-bellied woodpecker, which is the best of all the birds. And then over here, we've got its range. Um, and that is where you expect to find red-bellied woodpeckers. That's where you're not going to get a rare bird alert if you say you've seen one, that kind of thing. Uh, but if I look, if I just pick a random spot within that purple area, and I go there, is there a 100% chance I'm going to see a red-bellied woodpecker? No, nah, it's actually pretty good, though, because they're habitat generalists. <laughs> they might, might not be the best example of this. But yeah, no. If I land in the middle of a cornfield, in uh, Illinois, then probably I'm not going to see one, right? In other words, this is a very large scale, and it's just showing you the range or the outermost places where you regularly see this bird. Um, so scale becomes very important. That's what this slide's about. And we this is something that, that if you go into landscape ecology, you would go into in quite a bit more detail. We will barely get to it at the end of the semester in more detail than I'm giving you right now. Uh, but basically, it starts at the top with the range of the horned lark, except it's already more specific than the map I showed you for the red-bellied woodpecker uh, because it's showing you that uh, for whatever reason... Oh, okay, I see why. Uh, so the entire range is in green. The high density areas are the lighter colored. Uh, and I don't really know why they chose a lighter color. I would have done reverse, right? The whole range is the lighter color and where they're most concentrated darker, but that's not what they did. <clears throat> so they're already pointing out that the density is not the same across the whole range, okay? Um, then what it does is it takes a patch of habitat in their high density area and they zoom in so that you begin to see on the landscape level that the landscape is not uniform or homogenous across that whole area, but rather you're gonna have patches and then even within those patches, you're going to have territory set up for the horn logs where um, they're going to be found specifically and then areas where they're not found. And then finally down here, it says, even if I look at this territory, there are going to be places within that territory that they're using and places that they're not. Okay. And so looking at them at different scales gives you a lot of information. <clears throat> and if you were worried about the conservation of this species, 
then knowing where they're located in the United States, I guess, is a start, but it's not going to help you figure out why they're declining, for example. You're going to have to move down to a finer scale. Uh, when I took advanced ecology in grad school, I took it from an aquatic biologist, and he gave an example that I understood pretty well, so we'll try that one too. Um, so when the, when the ichthyologists first started out going out and characterizing streams, what they would do is they would find a stream over here, they would measure its width, they would measure how fast the water's flowing, they would look at the substrate, and then they would find another stream over here that has very similar characteristics, same width, same flow of water, same substrate, and then they would sample the fishes and then see whether they found the same things, right? With the hypothesis being that if they have the same environmental conditions, you would expect to see the same type of fishes. Uh, but what they found was sometimes the fish communities did not match. And so you had to figure out why. And so what you have to do then is you have to increase your scale in this case. And if you do that, a lot of times what they would find is this stream is a part of this river's watershed and this stream is a part of this river's watershed. And so the scale was able to explain why you had differences between those two communities because fish don't have really good ways of getting from this watershed to this watershed. Essentially. They don't walk across land very well. Okay. So that scale can be very important. Uh, for this slide, mostly I just want you to think about how scale can be important and can help you answer questions that might come up at a larger scale, you might be able to answer by looking at a finer scale, or vice versa in the case of the watersheds. All right. <clears throat> Specifically talking about niches. <clears throat> Got a picture of some of these scientists so that you can see, look them in the eye. <laughs> Actually, it's always kind of interesting. I'm like, I'm not sure I would have realized that guy looked like that. All right. Um, the idea of niche and habitat have been closely related for a very long period of time, which is why I started by trying to talk a little bit about habitat and the types of things we might discuss with habitat. And so the first time we had niche associated with ecology was around 1917 by the guy in this photograph. His name is Grinnell. Uh, he was an ornithologist whoop, whoop, out in California. <laughs> um, he is, he, if, you, if you pay attention to who came up with a lot of your foundational ecology stuff in your general ecology textbook, uh, this guy's name comes up a lot. So this is called a Grinnellian niche, uh, and then you also see him associated with some tropic pyramids and some other types of stuff, if you really look hard. Anyway, he basically defined niche as a subdivision of the environment occupied by a species subdivision of the environment occupied by a species. If you think about the slides we just went over, that's what we just described, right? And so modern day, that would make niche equivalent to habitat. That is our definition of habitat that we use today. <clears throat> Why he introduced it? I don't know. Because we already had a word that basically did this, right? So we already used the word habitat at that point. And so it shouldn't be a big surprise that people were confused about the differences between niches and habitat and how should I use these two terms. And so an animal ecologist by the name of Elton, again, one of our found founders of a lot of our ecological principles, in 1927 decided that we should be more specific about what's habitat versus what's niche. And so he redefined niche as the fundamental role of an organism in its community. In other words, he was the one that made that separation that generally sticks. Like in high school, that's what you pick up. In general biology, it's mostly what I want them to pick up. And that's the idea that habitat is where the organism lives, it's its address. Whereas niche is its job, what is its function, what is it doing in the environment. So that came around with Elton. Who, by the way, when I was looking at these pictures, looks not that much different from Grinnell. The second guy looks a little different. So in 1957, uh, what was happening around that time in ecology is we began to want to measure an organism's niche. And so it's a little bit hard to measure somebody's job, it's a little bit abstract. And so Hutchinson, who's a very famous limnologist, he tried to build a food web for 
one of the Great Lakes. I never remember which one. And he wrote a paper about it. It's extremely complex. And it's when we learned that food webs are probably too complex to be practical in a lot of ways. That's Hutch Hutchinson. He was a limnologist. And he redefined niche as all aspects, both physical and biological, of an organism's environment. All aspects, both physical and biological, of an organism's environment. And so he's trying to make it all encompassing so that anything that you can think of that might impact where you find an organism in its habitat would be included as part of its niche. And so this is the foundation of the models that we build today as we describe an organism's niche. The short version of this refers to the mathematical models, so down here at the bottom. And so the short version is if you take all aspects of an organism's niche, both physical and biological, and you put them into a model, then what we do is we build what's called a multi-dimensional hypervolume, which is really cool to say. Now you should go out all day today. Man, we learned about hyperdimensional or multi-dimensional hypervolumes. All right? You kind of know a little bit about this already if you know how to make a graph, right? Uh, your x-axis is one dimension, right? Your y-axis y -axis is a second dimension. And most of the time, especially in undergraduate, that's as far as we go. So you just build a two-dimensional graph, you know, like a, a bar graph, for example, or a pie chart. Man, pie chart's even less dimensional, really. Um, that, that's kind of multi-dimensional, sort of. You only have two, right? Uh, but we could add that axis that comes out this way, right? And that would add a third dimension. Now we're really getting into multi-dimensional, okay? Um, our brains don't really do that well past three. We can do three-dimensional okay. You start adding a fourth dimension, fifth dimension, sixth dimension, so we start to have problems uh, comprehending that. Uh, but basically what it's saying is the more factors that we can think of that would impact the organism that we can measure, the better space, mathematical space, we can create for that organism. So we start out with three dimensions, maybe we end up with something that's uh, obloid. I don't want to go with a perfect spear because that's almost never going to happen. So maybe something maybe a little bit egg-shaped when we put three dimensions. Now we need to add a fourth dimension and a fifth dimension and a sixth dimension and you end up with this space that's hard for us to visualize. Lucky for y'all, we're not going to go out that many dimensions. We're going to go three uh, for the most part. And then I'm going to talk to you at some point about how we kind of deal with multidimensional space by compressing it into a two-dimensional graph. Okay, That's what we basically do. Um, <laughs> and so I, I took a class. Don't ask me much about it because it was a long time ago. Uh, but I took a class in grad school called multivariate statistics, where we did things like principal component analysis and discriminant analysis. Um, that's typically what you would do as you're building these types of models. Okay, and I'll talk more about it when we get to um, get to a picture. <clears throat> and luckily, we're not doing that either. But you do do it a little bit in plant ecology for those of y'all in plant ecology, I believe. They they build a lot more multi-dimensional uh, models than the, the animal people do. <clears throat> All right, and so we're starting out really basic here, okay, and we're just going to start with our first dimension, and that dimension could be any aspect of the organism's environment that we want to, but to put a word on it so that you can start to visualize something, let's say this is the size food that this organism takes, and so we would go from small to large, and within this range of food sizes, this is what they take, essentially. Um, now, I want to go ahead and say I've pulled these from various places, but in reality, uh, if we were actually doing this graph, okay, they're trying to flatten it into a single dimension. That's the reason why they're not. But if I actually did their food size and by frequency, for example, what they take most often and what they take least often, uh, these are going to be bell curves, right? And so the way they actually got this was they looked at the smallest and the largest that they ate, but at this point it's not telling you what they use most often, which is probably right here in the center, right? Y'all following along what I'm saying? It's going to be important in a minute when we build our own niche. All right, so that's one dimension. Uh, now we can add a second dimension. In this case, 
uh, maybe the perch that they're feeding from. That's what you might be meaning by foraging height. And so where were they in the environment? Were they on the ground? Uh, you know, were they at the bottom of a bush? Were they at the top of a tree? That's their foraging height. And they've already put these two together on this graph, but this right here is the range of heights in which the animal was observed in their environment. Okay. And so if you put this fat dimension, food size, and this dimension foraging height together, then you've got a very rudimentary two-dimensional niche. That's what this is, right? A two-dimensional niche. Everybody okay so far? All right. And then on the next one, like I said, we can bring uh, an axis that actually comes straight out towards us, right? It's kind of hard to draw that. And so they just have an arrow depicting our third dimension. But technically speaking, it should be coming straight out from the board. That's our third dimension. <clears throat> and in this case, they added humidity. And so, um, you know, maybe they're a salamander. I don't know. <laughs> and they went and they took the humidity from the place that they actually took food from and compared that to the general environment, some type of project like that. But anyway, when you add the humidity to this, that's giving you basically this axis right here, a range of humidities that they use, and now you've got a box. <laughs> and you can kind of think about that box. There. So what we're saying is this particular species would be found living within this box, within this range of these three factors that we have measured. We shouldn't find them outside of that box, just within that box describing their niche. <clears throat> All right. So would that be set like in specific like parameters of foraging height? So those are should be based on your observations. So I went out and watched these birds. Um, so I I've already, I think I've already told you, my master's, my PhD thesis was winter foraging ecology and yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Mm -hmm. And so I built these models, right? And so what I did is for three years, more or less, a little bit to a fourth year, is I went out in the winter and I followed the sapsuckers and I noted what part of the tree they were on, how high up in the tree they were, the diameter of the tree, the species of the tree. I measured all of these factors. And then I came back in, and the last year I spent, you know, analyzing that and, and writing my thesis. And so I would have, all right, these are the species that they used. This is the range of diameters that they used, never smaller than this, never higher than this. And so this should be based on your actual observations and as many observations as you can grab. Don't remember what my total number was, but it was up in the thousands. Okay. <clears throat> Probably have that spreadsheet somewhere. I wonder if I can still open it. It's been a long time ago. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this box isn't just hypothetical. It should be based on information collected about that species. Right. <clears throat> All right, on the next one, it gives you a different way of looking at it. Oops, why did I go over there? Here it is. <laughs> Probably because I was getting up ready to talk about what it's actually got along the bottom here a little bit. Um, and so in this case, if any of you have taken a maps course, a mapping course, and you've learned about topographic maps, some of you done that. And so when you're looking at a topographic map, if the lines are really close together, that means that you are ascending or descending, usually ascending. And so if you're looking at a map and it's flat, the lines are pretty far apart, and then you'll notice they get really close together, and that's basically you're going up a hill of some sort. Right? You remember that type of stuff? Um, that's what's happening here, essentially is we do have three different dimensions again. We're just looking at it in a more realistic way because in reality, if we measure three things about an animal, it's not gonna come out to be a perfect box. Right? That's just not generally what's gonna happen. And so in this case, we have our prey length along the, this axis. Um, and if you look at it carefully, it looks like it ranges from here to about here. All right, as the term, so it takes a lot of different prey lengths. It's pretty generalized. Um, the height above the ground at which they're foraging, also pretty broad if you look at it. So it's the width this way. Um, and then I don't remember what the H is anymore. <coughs> I forgot. I looked it up a couple years ago and I've forgotten again. Uh, but this is a third category, whatever it happens to be. So we've got prey length, height above the ground, maybe humidity. I don't know why we'd have humidity, but let's just pretend like it is. It starts with H, right? Um, and so this would be, essentially be the mountain, right? This would actually be out this way. And then we would go down from the mountain out to these areas. And between this area and this area is going to be very few observations. They're really far apart. Right? <clears throat> and so this is, again, a three-dimensional graph. Okay? Everybody okay with that? 
All right. Let me look real quick. Oh, yeah. I should have taken that picture out. This is the time of year I saw the flamingos last year in Tennessee. It's awesome. Maybe I should just leave it so every year I say that. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to build our own niche. And I'm going to ask you to learn how to build uh, two-dimensional niches. We're not going to build three-dimensional niches. Okay. Um, but I think we should do that since there's only one minute left. We should probably do that on Wednesday. And so the, the, the niche models, I think what I was confused on, so like when you made that like three-dimensional model, that's for like one species. 